A lot went down during The Crimes of Grindelwald, the second film in the Fantastic Beasts series. From plot twists to meeting new characters, it could be a bit overwhelming, which is why you may have missed a whole bunch of smaller details scattered throughout the film. Never fear, though, as we got you covered on that and bring you all the important details and Easter eggs you missed. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell to stay up to date with everything Screen Rant. Spoiler alert, by the way, you have been warned. Now, Accio List! Positive Memories As soon as Fantastic Beasts 2 was officially revealed as the crimes of Grindelwald and the cast was shown, many people were wondering how on earth Jacob Kowalski would be returning in the magical sequel. In the first film, he had his memory wiped, as per magical law, due to the fact that he is a muggle, or nomad as they call them in America. But not long into the film, Jacob is back and seems to remember quite a bit as to what transpired. In fact, he showed signs of remembering his magical adventure at the end of the first film, where we see his bakery full of Fantastic Beast pastries. So how does he remember? The answer is actually a lot simpler than that, but a bit more obscure. In the Harry Potter world, there is a spell that wipes away memories. Hermione Granger not only used the spell on two Death Eaters, but her own parents to keep them safe. Brutal! But the memory wiping scene at the end of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them wasn't the Obliviate spell. It was actually the Venom of Swooping Evil. Inside his briefcase in the first film, Newt states that the Venom only erases bad memories. Since Jacob's experience with magic was positive, he can remember, unlike the rest of New York who were traumatized. Shapeshifter One of the signature potions in the wizarding world is the Polyjuice Potion. It's notoriously difficult to make and apparently tastes like goblin urine, but our heroes regularly knock this back in order to temporarily transform into someone else. It's a great tool to allow characters to spy and infiltrate into areas where they may not be welcome otherwise. Nude actually uses the potion for a bit in Crimes of Grindelwald, impersonating his own brother. But with the power of the Elder Wand, the Dark Wizard Grindelwald, who was the most powerful Dark Wizard of all time at this point in history, doesn't need simply Polyjuice Potion. He can actually shapeshift into other beings, which makes him a master of disguise and infiltration. Unlike the Polyjuice Potion, which doesn't alter your voice in the movie versions, Grindelwald's shapeshifting power allows him to also mask his voice, meaning he truly becomes someone else. Grindelwald uses this tactic in the opening scene of the film, where it's revealed that he had swapped places with Abernathy and was actually outside his prison cell for some time already. Once he got his hands on his wand, he goes nuts. But we've seen his shapeshifting powers before. As a Turns out, this is how Grindelwald turned into Graves, a character he himself made up. Yeah, that's right, there never was any personal Graves. For the greater good. The Crimes of Grindelwald is a busy movie and doesn't always explain what's going on. That's why a passing comment by Grindelwald may have gone over the heads of many casual fans who have never read the books. After rejecting the mission to hunt down Credence Barebones for the Ministry of Magic, the ministers recruit Grimson, a powerful bounty hunter to track him down. As it turns out though, Grimson is actually working for Grindelwald and murders a caretaker who may have been close to Credence when he was a baby. Denied the answers he seeks, Credence ends up at the rally at the end of the film, where he sides with Grindelwald. Walt, all according to plan. You have to admire movie villains having really convoluted plans and then seeing them actually work perfectly. If only real life was like that. When Grimson reveals himself to be an agent of evil, Grindelwald says the words, for the greater good. If you've never read the books, then this went right over your head. When Albus and Grindelwald were teens, they both sought to rule over muggles. The mantra, for the greater good, was adopted and put into motion by none other than Dumbledore himself. Despite being enemies now, Grindelwald still uses that slogan, years after parting ways with Dumbledore. Rosier and Travers. The Crimes of Grindelwald is chock full of characters. A lot of characters, perhaps too many characters for its own good. But those who are familiar with some of the lesser characters in the Harry Potter era will have no doubt some of the names in Crimes of Grindelwald. The most obvious is, of course, Nagini. The future servant of Voldemort himself is actually the main attraction in a freak circus. She is a maledictus, which means she has a blood curse that will permanently transform her into a snake one day. But while that character's connection to Harry Potter is obvious, two others may not be. Grindelwald's right-hand lady is Vinda Rosier. She's cold, cruel, and a devout follower of Grindelwald's mission. Then there's also Torquil Travers, who is the head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement at the Ministry of Magic. He's the one who takes away Dumbledore's job teaching defense against the dark arts and puts the wrist trackers on him in order to keep tabs on his spellcasting. Despite working for the Ministry, he's a bit of a tool. Both of these characters will have grandchildren who will become Death Eaters in the Harry Potter era. Rosier was name-dropped during Karkaroff's Inquisition while Travers held Ginny at one point in the Department of Mysteries. 
Philosopher's Stone Nicholas Flamel is the only known maker of the Philosopher's Stone, to quote Hermione. And yeah, we're saying Philosopher's Stone, which is how it was originally written, so deal with it! He's an alchemist and is aging pretty well for someone who is around 600 years old. Sure, he's extremely fragile and can barely move, but hey, at least he's not a walking skeleton. Unlike the rest of the witches and wizards of J.K. Rowling's universe, Nicholas Flamel was an actual, real person who lived in France. He was also an alchemist who worked tirelessly to try and create a real Philosopher's Stone. But it doesn't look Look like he was too successful in this reality. But he clearly figured it out in the film, and we have proof of it. If his old and frail demeanor wasn't proof enough, we get a very quick shot of the stone itself in Flamel's house in Paris. Flamel takes out a special book in one scene, and makes a Wizarding World Skype call to another wizard in America who urges Flamel to help Newt and company fight Grindelwald. As he takes the book out of its safe, we can see the stone resting on a pedestal behind it, ready for more elixir when the time is right. The question now remains, how has he kept that item a secret, and how has no one ransacked his home by now? Blood Oath. In the crimes of Grindelwald, we finally learn why Albus Dumbledore hasn't moved on the dark wizard Grindelwald. The two are considered to be the most powerful wizards alive, and are respectfully each other's equals. And they have been for quite some time now. Fans of the book will recall that when Harry asked Dumbledore what he saw in the Mirror of Erised, his reply was that he saw thick woolen socks. This may be the only direct lie Dumbledore has told Harry. The rest was misdirection or omissions of facts. That slippery devil. But in Crimes of Grindelwald, we finally see what Dumbledore or sees in the mirror, and surprise, it's Grindelwald. It's here that we learn of the blood oath the two took when they were teenagers, a form of binding magic that prevents the pair from actually harming one another. With it, Grindelwald can't be harmed by his equal, and is likely why he's been so obsessed with finding credence. While we were too busy looking at the facts, did you happen to notice the actors? Do they look familiar to you at all? They are in fact the same actors who played young Albus and Grindelwald in Deathly Hallows Part 1. The only major difference is that young Grindelwald now sports the heterochromia in his eyes now. 1945. Towards the end of the film, Grindelwald gives a rousing speech to his followers at a rally underneath the Lestrange tomb in Paris. He urges them that the reason they need to rule over the Muggles is that they continuously fall into a pattern of violence and destruction that will one day destroy them all. These history-defining moments also have an impact on the Wizarding World, and Grindelwald has just about had enough of hiding in the shadows and waiting for the Muggles to ruin everything again. Using some sort of magical hookah, he shows the audience a brief glimpse into the future. It's here that we see a glimpse at a terrible-looking war. Yep, that's indeed the Second World War, complete with fighter planes and concentration camps. The First World War is still fresh in the minds of many citizens, including Jacob, and the idea of another one is pretty off-putting. But as Grindelwald talks of destruction and finality, there is a bit of foreshadowing going on in this scene for those who have read the books. Spoiler alert if you don't want to know how the fifth book ends. But as Grindelwald predicts the world will go to war again, you can't see that during that war, specifically in 1945, the war will come to him, and Albus Dumbledore will finally duel his once friend and wins. Nigellus. After confronting Dumbledore in the middle of his class, the Ministry of Magic decides to put a tracer on him to monitor all his spellcasting from here on out. The Ministry don't trust Dumbledore, even in his earlier years, something that will continue to happen to him until his final days. Little do they know, Albus will one day become Headmaster. Then they'll really have their hands full. Aiding Travers with the confrontation is Lita Lestrange, who used to be a student of Dumbledore's back in the day. After the showdown is over, Lita decides to take a stroll down memory lane and walk the castle before ending up in one of her old classrooms. It's here we see that she's carved N and L in one of the desks, marking her love for Newt even as a child. But that's not the only interesting carving in this desk. Sure, it's a small school, but talk about coincidence. This desk also belonged to Phineas Nigellus Black, the great-great-grandfather to Sirius Black, as evidenced by the name Nigellus carved into the wood. Black was the least popular headmaster in Hogwarts history, but helped Harry quite often in the books by passing messages between between Hogwarts and Twelve Grimald Place. Sirius Black's cousin, Bellatrix, would eventually marry into the Lestrange family as well, so talk about one important classroom desk. Ministry Owls. Things just weren't working out for Harry in the early moments of the Order of the Phoenix. First, he gets no letters from his friends, then he's seemingly expelled from Hogwarts for doing magic in front of a muggle. But there are grounds for an appeal, and Harry is whisked off to the Ministry of Magic to see if they can't undo that expulsion. Arthur Weasley takes Harry to London through the visitor's entrance, and we get to see the Ministry for the first time in the Wizarding World. As they rush through elevators, we see that the memos are passed through the memo by simply enchanting the papers to fly around on their own. A much 
much more practical method, as apparently the Ministry used to use owls to deliver mail within the building, and that made quite the mess. Well, in the crimes of Grindelwald, it looks like someone hasn't thought to simply enchant the paper to fly to its destination yet. Someone give that witch or wizard a raise! In one shot, we see a house elf hard at work scrubbing some interior windows within the Ministry. Yep, that's right, that poor elf is cleaning up owl crap off the side of that window. It's a small detail, but it lets the viewers know of the connective tissue between the two film franchises. Aurelius. Easily the biggest moment of the entire film was the final two minutes, where Grindelwald dropped a bombshell on the audience. Throughout the whole film, Credence was on a quest to find out who his real parents were, and continuously comes up short. Meanwhile, a plotline with Lita Lestrange seems to imply that Credence may in fact be her long-lost brother, making Credence a member of that family. But instead of going for the obvious, J.K. Rowling decided to pull the rug from under us, and revealed that Credence is actually, in fact, Aurelius Dumbledore, the brother to Albus Dumbledore. Or is he? J.K. Rowling may have been teasing this big reveal over two years. On her website, if you click on the Answers tab, you'll notice that the featured image is of the book Mediations by Marcus Aurelius. Even more interesting is that she uploaded that image in 2016. So what's the clue here? The name Aurelius wasn't random, and obviously J.K. Rowling wants us to ponder. The real Marcus Aurelius ruled as Roman Emperor with his adoptive brother Lucius Verus for a while. So it seems that Joe is in fact implying that Grindelwald is lying, and that Credence was adopted, not born, into the Dumbledore family. Hopefully we get answers in 2020 when Fantastic Beasts 3 hits the big screen. There's no doubt there's a lot to unpack in The Crimes of Grindelwald, and even more to try and puzzle out. What detail did you catch on your first viewing? Was there anything that we might have missed? What do you hope happens in the third entry of this five-film franchise? Let us know in the comments below, and be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Get more videos like this in your playlist every day. Thanks for watching.